Let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 15. Mark 15, and uh, we are going to talk about the cross today. Over these Sundays in uh, preparation leading up to Easter, we've been looking at eight days that changed the world from that uh, triumphant entry into Jerusalem to Easter Sunday in those eight days. Now, today, we are all the way to Friday of that week and the cross. I haven't preached a sermon like this in a few years, and uh, I like to, uh, on a fairly regular basis, do a sermon that just is about the cross. We're going to survey the wondrous cross today. There are a lot of responses when, when we do this, when we focus in on the cross of Christ, and uh, a couple of illustrations, a young boy listening to his teacher tell about the death of Christ on the cross said, could you skip this part? It's just too sad. Why don't you skip to the happy part of the story? An adult woman who said, I don't like to talk about the death of Christ because it's too depressing and ugly and I have too much trouble in my own life. And I, I, I just, I don't want to talk about the cross so much. And that pattern is, is an ever-growing trend, I think, in, in our land. It's a desire to clean up, sterilize the cross of Christ rather than discuss blood and beatings and crosses. Let's just talk about love and peace and hope. Truthfully, I don't think Satan would like anything better than that. Uh, he would, of course, understand what we often miss, that there is no love and there is no hope and there is no peace in this life or in eternity apart from Jesus who died on the cross to pay for our sins. There's no forgiveness of sin. There is no salvation. There's no eternal life. There's no relationship to God apart from what Jesus did one Friday on a cross. Without the cross, here's what happens. Jesus is just another good teacher. Apart from the cross, Jesus can just be that fine moral example in the world. Apart from the cross... Jesus is just another option among all the world's religions and cults of somebody to follow. There's only one way of salvation, and it comes from standing at the foot of the cross. The old saying is the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all stand, stand there equally in need of a Savior equally lost and hopeless apart from what Jesus did for us at the cross. If we'll place our faith in him as Savior, surrender our lives to him as Lord, we can be saved. But you can't ignore and you can't gloss over the cross of Christ. The, the, what Jesus did at the cross, it's really the central event in all history, central event in the Bible. Everything before it's just flowing in that direction. Everything after it flows out of the consequence of what Jesus did at the cross. So today we're going to go on a journey to the cross on which Jesus died. And, and not just that he died, but that he died on a cross to pay for my sin, to pay for your sin. And that, that whole thing of the cross... It can't just be a theological idea. It can't just be a Bible story. It has to, get, it has to be personal for us. And uh, my prayer for today is that it would become personal because only when it becomes personal uh, does it become life-changing and eternity-touching. Mark chapter 15, and we're going to begin back in verse 20, Mark 15. Here's, what, here's how Mark describes what was passed on to him, probably by Peter maybe others who were witness to the events directly. Mark was uh, always in the neighborhood of what was taking place. He writes it down for us. Verse 20 of Mark 15. After they had mocked him, Jesus, 
They stripped him of the purple robe and put his clothes on him. They led him out to crucify him. They forced a man coming in from the country who was passing by to carry Jesus' cross. He was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him, divided his clothes, casting lots for them to decide what each should get. Now, it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge written against him was, The King of the Jews. They crucified two criminals with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads, saying, Ha, the one who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself by coming down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests and scribes were mocking him among themselves, saying, He saved others, but he can't save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down for now from the cross so that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God. My God, why have you abandoned me? When some of those standing there heard this, they, they said, see, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, fixed it to a stick, offering him a drink, and said, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed his last. Then the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom, when the centurion who was standing opposite him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Some things I want to note about this story of Jesus on the cross, and it's a very simple outline we have today. It's a simple story, and it's so simple that we may pass by it way too quickly. First thing is, Jesus' death on the cross was a real death. There, there have always been people who try to clean up this story by making it something else. That the story of Jesus dying on the cross was more of a parable. It's a teaching lesson. It didn't actually happen. It wasn't a literal story. That Jesus perhaps just uh, passed out on the cross, swooned on the cross, and he was taken down. His disciples and I nursed him back to health and then started telling people, look, he's been raised from the dead. Jesus died on the cross. The Roman soldiers, led by a Roman centurion skilled in the art of death and identifying the dying and death, verified and made sure that their job was done. It's little, little wonder Jesus died. This is a part of the story that we also passed by too quickly perhaps the man Jesus again fully God fully man that miracle of the incarnation in his human body Jesus was half dead before he was nailed to a cross he'd been up uh, we know all night struggling in prayer he'd had nothing to eat or drink for somewhere around based on our timeline around 15 hours he had gone without anything to eat or drink he was tried before Annas. Annas is uh, the power behind the high priesthood in Jerusalem. He wasn't the acting high priest, but when they took Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane and took him to the first authority, the first person he saw was Annas, uh, father-in-law of Caiaphas. He'd next go to Caiaphas, the acting high priest, for a preliminary trial, then a full trial. Then eventually he'd come back to Caiaphas for a repeat trial. He'd been tried by Pilate, who found out he was from Galilee, so he sent him to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas sent him back to Pilate, and this time Pilate uh, 
Pilate issues judgment on Christ and he is sent to be crucified. We're told in the scriptures that throughout these proceedings, Jesus has been pushed, shoved, he's been hit in the face, he's been beaten, he's been whipped across his back, a crown of thorns pressed on his head. He's undergone the emotional pain of you know, Judas has betrayed him, Peter has denied him, all the disciples deserted him. His enemies, the soldiers mocked him, the religious leaders lied. Victims of crucifixion were typically beaten with this uh, whip, leather strands on the, on the whip with bone and metal tied at intervals along the way. And, and uh, it was a brutal weapon. It was not unusual that folks would not survive that. Uh, it'd catch in bad places and in ugly ways. People lost teeth, lost eyes. Sometimes victims disemboweled by the process of of the whip and if they survive the scourging uh, victims misery on the cross is just uh, elevated and all this happened to Jesus we would certainly not be surprised to learn that Jesus would have been a pitiful sight when he was taken to the cross probably barely recognizable he, and that's because of the bruising, because of the blood, because of the swelling. Usually the victim was placed uh, in, in the middle of four Roman guards and they would march them to the place of execution on big public roads. Uh, they wanted everybody to see. And they'd take a long route to get to the place of execution so that a lot of people would see uh, one of the things about the Romans, they never wasted anything. They were terribly efficient. And they wanted every execution to be public and visible to as many people as possible because they saw it as a deterrent to rebellion, to crime. And Jesus was crucified beside one of the main roads that led in and out of Jerusalem as he walked through the streets of Jerusalem on his way to the place of execution. Victims of crucifixion were usually stripped naked, added to the humiliation of the experience. Their clothes uh, were part of the compensation for the execution team. And so the clothes, and by the way, uh, in, my, in my Bible reading, I've been reading, um, I read two months ago, I read the Easter story from the from the triumphant entrance into Jerusalem to the end of the Gospels. I read all four of those as I was getting ready for the series. Well, now I'm reading about the 10 chapters in each Gospel. I have one Gospel to go in between, uh, not the beginning of the Gospel, but the middle of those four Gospels, uh, the biographies of Jesus. And I'm amazed at how many times in that run, Jesus says to his disciples, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be beaten, going to be tried I'm going to be crucified and on the third day I'm going to rise again and it says the disciples said what in the world is he talking about those were times when there were huge crowds he was popular it seemed everything was going great what was he talking about Jesus pointed to the cross the resurrection over and over the Old Testament is filled with prophecies pointing to what would take place at the cross and one of those prophecies is about they will cast lots. They will gamble for his clothing. All these things uh, taking place as foretold by the prophets. No vital organs were typically damaged in crucifixion. So crucifixion itself, uh, uh, painful and miserable, but not fatal uh, for a while. So the victims seldom died in less than around 36 hours. Some people would linger on a cross for days. Usually, uh, the crucified you know, would lose control of bladder and bowel function. Uh, the description we get from historical sources, the stench and the sight around cru crucifixion were just unbearable. Uh, as if the suffering and humiliation were not enough, the one being crucified would be subjected to the taunts, the ridicule, the passers-by, because people just, people are sinful and broken and 
love the misery of others, it appears, and always has been. And so Jesus was under constant verbal attack, not only from his enemies, uh, Mark tells us, even from the two guys being crucified on either side. We know one of them eventually is going to turn the corner to believe in him, but even the criminals on either side. Huge crude spikes would be driven through their hands and feet. And it's, you've, a lot of you have heard lots of sermons about crucifixion, and people will say, a lot of people think this is how it worked, but this is how it really worked. You ever heard those sermons? Well, here's why you hear those sermons. Because crucifixion happened in a whole lot of different ways. Uh, we, we find examples of a cross that's tall with a crossbar, the part up high. We find crosses where you have the upright pole and just one uh, crossbar, nothing, nothing up above. You find crosses that are the tall cross. You find crosses that they were about this high. It was more convenient for the Roman soldiers to do what all, the, all they were doing, take care of things. And so they're more just a little overhead high. You find crosses that are X-shaped and how someone was fashioned to a cross. Sometimes their arms were strapped to the crossbar and uh, nails right through the palms of their hands. Sometimes uh, if there was more weight that needed to be carried by, uh, and needed more support, uh, the spikes would be driven through the wrist. There's more tendon, more bone to carry more weight. When it comes to the feet, there are examples in uh, archaeology, one foot over the other, one spike through both feet. Uh, the complication was it was hard to get those feet to stay where you want them to stay, drive that spike. And so you find sometimes both feet with uh, nailed to the crossbar. There's an example in the Israeli Museum they found of an ankle bone and uh, with the support in between the feet and they drove the spike at a right angle and uh, attached that way. But the one thing about the feet is that it was a, the person would have to put some support uh, by pushing up against the spikes because you, uh, if you're hanging, as liquid begins to build up in the lungs, you have to raise up so you can still get a breath, a desperate gasp of air time to time. And uh, this all happened to Jesus. Victims of crucifixion were typically helpless against the weather, whether it was the hot Middle Eastern sun or anything else the weather brought their way, insects, birds. The days of or hours of hanging on the cross, depending on the victim, People would die if they were there for a while, ex just exposure, hunger, dehydration, fever, trauma, tetanus, gangrene. If the, if the Romans wanted to accelerate death, and sometimes they did, they had a wooden mallet available to them uh, most always. And then we know from the biblical story in Jesus' case, they're coming up on Passover, they're coming over, uh, they don't want these guys hanging on a because of some Old Testament law. I love that. The religious guys who, are, who have manipulated this whole process, they want to be really religious and not offend the Old Testament law. So they wanted these guys down from the cross before the uh, Sabbath, and it's a special Sabbath because it's also Passover begins. And so they would break their legs. The reason they broke their legs, they couldn't raise up anymore, pushing up against the spikes to get that breath. And most people would die of suffocation in that case uh, rather quickly. When we, we learned from the Gospels that when they got to Jesus, Jesus was already dead. Uh, so they did not break his legs, which also was prophesied in the Old Testament. They wouldn't break any bones. But they had to be sure the job was done. And so they stabbed him in the side with a spear to make sure the work was complete. What we learn is that Jesus' death was real and it was horrible. And that's not a detail that we should overlook or take lightly. Jesus died on a Roman cross on a Friday afternoon. It was a real death. It was also a sacrificial death. Jesus' enemies, Mark tells us, they, they called out to him on the cross. Hey, he saved others. Let him save himself. Come down from the cross. Then we'll believe. And they probably thought that argument was pretty strong. What they failed to see is that Jesus uh, and what he was about and the importance of what he was doing on the cross 
we learned from these verses, it wasn't the nails or ropes that held Jesus to the cross. His love held him, held him to the cross. And they said, if you'll come down, then we'll believe. And I've come to know in my life that the reason I believe is because Jesus did not come down. But he stayed to complete the work of redemption at the cross. Jesus' life was in no way taken from him on that Friday. He willingly gave, surrendered his life at the cross. And he did that for me. He did that for you. There's a foundational truth we have to understand about Jesus and the cross. Jesus took our place at the cross. All of sin and falls short of the glory of God. That's all of us. The wages of sin is death. Jesus, who never sinned, is dying, paying the price for our sin. He sacrificed himself for us. He was our substitute. And we say that, and we say it so quickly and so easily. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Sounds clean and uh, proper, pure, and how unlike the event of Jesus dying on the cross. We poorly understand and appreciate he not only died for our sins, but he died in one of the most painful, shameful ways that sinful people ever created. How is it possible that Jesus could die, sinless son of God, but that he died? Some people said, well, it's because no one ever suffered more than Jesus suffered at the cross. Well, there's a lot of suffering in the world. There are a lot of people who are, there are two guys crucified with him that day. The, the price paid for sin is not because of just how much Jesus suffered, but where he came from to suffer. He came from the glory of heaven. The sinless son of God came to this broken world and died on a, on a shameful cross created by sinful people. And that distance between there and there was sufficient distance to pay the price for the sins of the world. My sin and your sin, sin for all time. Everything that needed to take place. No, no human being should ever have to suffer such a death for any crime. Jesus died for our sins. Not even for anything he had done, but for us. We also know this. Jesus' death was a saving death. What Jesus did on the cross saves us. Jesus did for us on the cross what we could not do for ourselves. The, what happens, what does sin do? Sin separates us from God. Our relationship with God is broken and we are separated from him and we cannot bridge this gap. We cannot fix this problem. Overwhelmingly, when we talk about this with folks, here's what they say. Well, I'm a pretty good person. You know, what... what has there ever been a time in your life you made a commitment to Christ? You know if you die today, you'd go to heaven? Oh, well, I'm a good person. I try to do good things. Uh, I've had this conversation multiple times. If you, died, if you died today, do you know without a doubt you'd go to heaven? Tell me why you think that. And we get this answer. Oh, my goodness. When I was growing up, my parents had us in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I was baptized when I was 10 years old in a creek out behind the house. Oh, yeah, I'm sure I'm going to heaven. So far, you haven't given me a Christian testimony. I'm good enough. I went to church. Well, I, you know, I'm, I got baptized. Okay, well, I took a shower this morning. It got me wet. It didn't wash away my sins. Has there ever been a time in your life when you gave your life to Jesus? And that question is a question that all of us need to answer. Jesus came. Oh, my goodness. They're all the, everybody's got a plan. Well, here's my plan. I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to do a bunch of religious stuff. I'm going to, I got my own plan working, and I think it's going to be plenty. Well, I believe that thing, but, well, then, I, you know, live a good life. So I'm going to add to the plan. I'm going to improve on, on God's plan. If there was another way to do this, God wouldn't have done that. The reason he did that is because that's the only way. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin, God's word says. There had to be a sacrifice. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus came.
to be that perfect sacrifice that we might be saved. The beauty of Christ's death on the cross is that it saves us from death. We're going to die physically. Jesus didn't come in our lifetime. We're going to die physically, but we don't have to die spiritually. By accepting Jesus as our Savior, trusting our life to Him, Jesus' death saves us from the fear of death, saves us from the brokenness that comes with sin, the devastation of a separation from God and hell for eternity, just the hopelessness of that kind of destiny. All because of what Jesus did to the cross. Then it's a victorious death. Mark's gospel account tells us, Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. You compare the different uh, gospels and you find those seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. John's gospel tells us uh, probably that loud cry was, it is finished. It is finished. So what was finished? Jesus didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it is finished. What was finished? The plan for salvation. The payment for sin. Finished. What he said when it is finished, it's just one word. The beautiful, uh, all of you uh, folks who have been working on taxes, all you accountants out there, here's a good accountant word for you, to tell us die. It's an accounting term. Jesus, the last, the, one of the last, last or next to last thing he's going to say from the cross, tetelestai. Paid in full. It is finished. Paid in full. People uh, in culture, Jesus' time, someone had making payments on something. When it was paid off, they would mark it, tetelestai. Paid in full. The debt's paid. Everything that needs to be paid has been paid. All paid up. Your account is clear. Through Jesus' death, our debt of sin is paid in full. Tetelestai. That shout was not a cry of frustration. It's finished. Not a cry of defeat, but a declaration. Victory in Jesus. Victory. Jesus completed the mission for which he came to earth. He completed everything he set out to do and to demonstrate that victory. Mark gives us a couple of examples uh, at the end of what we read from chapter 15. He says, first of all, the veil in the temple was torn in two. Now, a few weeks ago, we were in the temple. We spent some time. We toured the temple. We looked at how the temple was arranged. And there's that big, big veil, maybe as much as 30 feet tall, it's a thick veil, and it separated everything else in the temple from the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. We know that only once a year the high priest was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, and he'd offer on the Day of Atonement, offer atonement for the sins of the nation. And here's what happened. Jesus, it is finished, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. The cool part is, if it was what we could do, we'd have, to, we'd have to start at the bottom and tear it from there. But it says it was torn in two from top to bottom. Because Jesus' death on the cross opened the way. There's no more a barrier between any of us, all of us, the world, and the Savior. A relationship to God has been opened by what Jesus did at the cross and surely this man was the son of God. Says one of the most hard-hearted guys you could ever imagine, this Roman centurion whose assignment out of all the things you might do in the Roman army, in the Roman legions, carrying out crucifixions. His heart was hard. He had seen everything. Uh, there was so, mu so much violence, so much bloodshed, you just become callous to anything and anyone. But this guy, you learn a lot about somebody from how they die. And Jesus, the way he died, just softened up everything in this heart, guy's hard heart. And he says, surely this man was the son of God. The thief on the cross has put his faith in Christ. Now a Roman centurion at the foot of the cross says, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know everything about him, but whatever he is, I'm putting my faith there. It's a reminder to me 
that what Jesus did at the cross can transform the worst sinner. And if he can do that, he can transform my life too. We talked about the distance between where Jesus came from and the cross as being sufficient. Uh, that distance to pave the way for the forgiveness of sins of the world. But a lot of us, we don't feel like, well, I'm not the Roman centurion. In fact, I'm a more of your garden variety sinner. I'm not a bad sinner. I know a lot of people that are worse than I am. And I think my distance from God because of my sin isn't that far. And I think I, think I can bridge the gap myself by the stuff I do, being a good religious person. I'm a pretty good guy. Do some good religious things. Care about people in need. And so I can do it myself. And most people are on that self-improvement plan. But here's the thing. It's about distance again. Because we forget even one sin, and by the way, don't kid yourself into thinking you're, one, you're a one sin sinner. Even one sin is enough when it's against almighty, holy, pure, perfect God of the universe. Even that one sin is enough to separate us for all eternity. And eternity in hell is what we deserve. It is cosmic treason to sin against a holy, perfect God. Even one sin is enough. And that's why we all need a Savior today. The cross of Christ is not a theological concept. It's not just a Bible story. It's, it's practical. And it has to be personal. Today, Is this all subtle for you? I'm not talking about, oh yeah, I've heard this story before. There, there's things that flow out of a life that, that belongs to him. It, is this all subtle for you? And I don't, ever, I don't want anybody to walk out of here not having this settled, so I want to give you the opportunity right now. I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin and I believe he was raised from the dead and I, I want to turn from my sin and I'm surrendering my whole life to Jesus. I want to follow him with all my heart and I want him to make all things new in me. If you've never made that commitment, if you've been on the self-improvement plan, if you've been on the my love always gone to church plan, instead of a Savior and Lord plan. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. I want to lead you in that kind of commitment prayer. It can't just be a religious thing of saying the prayer. It has to be your heart with God's heart. But I want to lead you in that kind of prayer and maybe give you some words to work with to say, for you to say yes to Jesus today. So let's bow our heads and I want to pray. Maybe you would pray after me as I pray out loud. You just silently, you and God in your heart, you would say, Dear God, thank you that you love me that much. I know my sin. And I'm lost in my sin. Please forgive me. I want to turn away from sin. And I'm turning my life to Jesus. I believe the Bible says he's the son of God. I believe he died on the cross to pay for my sin. He took my place. I believe he was raised from the dead. Come into my life, Jesus. Take away my sin. I want to surrender my life to you. I want to walk with you and walk close from this day forward. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now take the ABCD card. Some of you have seen these before, certainly. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is something uh, just, a, it's a, from time to time, it's just good to touch base on things. An ABCD card is a touch base thing. It's a way to uh, just communicate. I'd love to sit down with all of you and say, so tell me. 
uh, was there a time in your life? And there was a time in my life when uh, I was living uh, alone, feeling alone and afraid. I came to know the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I surrendered my life to him. And now I have hope. And I have peace that have carried me through all sorts of things. D do you have a story like that? Was there a time in your life when it all turned? Well, this is a way to communicate that without us having individual conversations. And always welcome the individual conversation. We can cover a lot in a hurry here. So with the card, A, B, C, D. Just, I'm going to ask you just to circle one of those. And... Uh, no, this is where I am. This is my story right now. A just means, you know, Chad, there was a time in my life. I know, the day, I, know, I know when that time, I don't know, I may not know the exact day on the calendar, but I know that time was in my life when I surrendered my life to Jesus and I was saved. Uh, I've already done that. A is I have already made that commitment, and it's still real in my life and personal in my life today. Already. That's A. B. When I led that prayer earlier, maybe you'd say, today, I'm getting this right. Today, I, I'm surrendering my life to Jesus. Today, I am believing. I'm putting all my faith in Jesus. And letter B would say, today was my day. Some of you, you may have done it, but you've never been baptized, and we want to give you a chance when we're on letter B to say, just write baptized. You can spell it any way you want to baptized. I want to be baptized, and we will celebrate new life in Christ with you. We'll arrange for that and uh, have that conversation about what baptism is and how you can uh, move forward in that. Letter C, for a lot of people, all ages, you say, that's a lot to swallow on a Sunday morning, and that's a big commitment, and I recognize the, the depth of it. Maybe I'm I believe that story, but the surrender part, I, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that looks like for me. But I'm, I'm considering, considering it. I'm thinking about it. Uh, I'm, I'm in process. I'm not there yet, but I'm considering it. Letter C. Letter D, we just have to have one more choice because there's one more response that we can do to this. And So letter D is just, I don't ever intend to do this. I don't have any interest in making that commitment to Christ. I think I'm going to be just fine. Or I'm not interested in religious stuff. So I don't ever intend to do that. And please, uh, you know, just I appreciate your honesty in uh, communicating that in A, B, C, D. And what we're going to do is uh, for our ushers, if you, you guys could do a favor for me at the end, not now, but at the end, if you can get those offering plates, just be standing at doors. Uh, if our ushers would do that, then... When you go by, just hand it to them, or you can drop by the Connection Center, and me, other members of our uh, ministry team will be there, and you can give those to us. Just here's where it is today, A, B, C, D, and we appreciate that favor. Now, we are going to close the service with uh, just some reminders about this story, because we are focused on the cross today, and all that in preparation for the empty tomb next Sunday. So I want you to be in a spirit of meditation and focus just now. And I want you to listen closely. We're going to drop the lights down. And uh, let's, uh, let's focus on this cross. One of you will betray me. All of you will desert me. Judas went out, and it was night. This is my body. This is my blood. They went out to the Mount of Olives. They came to a place called Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. Pray you will not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The betrayer is near. Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Have you come with swords? His disciples deserted him and ran. They led him to the chief priests. Are you the Christ? 
Jesus kept silent. You will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. He deserves death. Peter denied him a third time. The rooster crowed. He was handed over to Pilate. Judas hangs himself. Are you the king of the Jews? Shall I release Jesus or Barabbas? What shall I do with Jesus? Crucify, Crucify him. him. They twisted together a crown of thorns. They mocked, they spit, they hit. They came to a place called Golgotha, place of the skull. He was crucified between two criminals. Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. Today you will be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. The veil of the temple was torn in two. Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for his body. A stone was rolled over the entrance to the tomb. Next Sunday, we're going to begin here uh, with the lights down. And then we're going to celebrate that the stone was rolled away. Between here and next Sunday, don't lose your focus on the cross and what Jesus did for you there. Make that a part of your meditation. Read through those gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and tell the story of what Jesus did for us at the cross. It's, uh, it's dark, and it's hard. But always remember, that was on Friday. Friday. Because you see, Sunday was coming. God bless you.